Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we have several people joining us, so we're going to give it another maybe minute, and then we'll get started. Okay, I see still a few people coming in, um, but I think we're going to go ahead and get started just to keep us on time and on track today. Welcome to PWSA's first sleep summit and our third presentation for the day. So we've had a great morning so far. We had Matt Horn Horsnell from Trend and Dr. Amy Ravana. Um, both sessions were great, lots of information, lots of questions. Um, again, these are being recorded and we will have them out on our YouTube channel and everybody who is registered um, will send out the uh, recording to you as well. And you can also get them on our social media, Facebook, et cetera, pages um, by the end of the week. So um, as many of you know, my name is Paige Rivard. I'm the CEO of PWSA USA and mom to Jake, age 12, living with PWS and also living with um, sleep sleep issues. Um, sleep issues are a common concern in the Prader-Willi syndrome community. These issues range from things such as lack of REM sleep, central and obstructive sleep apnea, daytime sleepiness, cataplexy, narcolepsy, just to name a few. Um, and we're so excited today to have the amazing speakers that we have who are specialists in the areas of sleep, sharing their knowledge with us throughout the day today. So if you have questions for Dr. Singh, please put them in the Q&A section. Uh, chat is disabled, but at the end of his presentation, we will take questions. Um, I'd also like to give a very special thank you to Harmony Biosciences for helping make this day, um, the Sleep Summit possible. And so I will go ahead and introduce Dr. Singh. He is the Vice Chair of Ambulatory Psychiatry Services at Maimonides Medical Center. Dr. Singh will be presenting on sleep abnormalities associated with behavioral problems in PWS. And um, many of you know and recognize Dr. Singh. He's an internationally recognized expert in the management of behavioral issues associated with Prader-Willi syndrome. He has numerous peer-reviewed reviewed publications and presentations on behavioral aspects of PWS. He remains active clinically and in clinical research. He serves on the scientific review boards for PWSA USA and the Foundation for Prader-Willi Research. He is also part of the International Prader-Willi Syndrome Organization's Mental Health Network. Dr. Singh's most recent work is his book, Neurobehavioral Manifestations of Prader-Willi Syndrome, a guide for clinicians and caregivers which is an easy read resource for all clinicians and caregivers um, taking care of people with uh, PWS. If you haven't read it, um, take a look at his book. I've read through it. It's a great, great resource. So without further ado, Dr. Singh, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Vard. Uh, thank you to uh, PWSA USA. Uh, for uh, for all that you do, um, uh, all of your advocacy efforts. I know that last week was super busy, and for you all to bounce back and put this, uh, uh, you know, first virtual sleep summit uh, on the road uh, at such, uh, you know, at such a pace. I think uh, it's commendable what you're doing for the whole community. Um, so. Uh, my talk today uh, hopefully will be sort of a little different from all the other talks, and I'll focus more on the behavioral issues that I see in Prader-Willi syndrome. 
um, that is described to me by the patients and by the families. Uh, and uh, what I noticed to be sort of overlapping with some sleep issues or sleep symptoms seem to be a prominent part of those uh, mental health problems. So um, let me go over, you know, just a quick disclosure slide. Uh, over the past year, I have done some consultancy work and advisory work for Salino, Radius, Levo. I have several grants, uh, two of them mentioned here, Guanfacine uh, Extended Release uh, for the treatment of aggression and irritability, bright light therapy for the treatment of excessive daytime sleepiness, which I'm going to talk about a bit more today. Uh, I will talk at the end uh, about my book uh, just to uh, provide some more resources uh, for everyone who's listening in. Today, uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to try not to rush, uh, but over the, the um, hour, uh, less than the hour, we'll try to sort of go over some common sleep abnormalities, trying not to be repetitive, um, behavioral issues, and then determining the cause of sleep disturbance, trying to, you know, hopefully by the end of the session, you'll get to know if there's a sleep issue in your loved one with PWS, be able to get a sense of whether it's coming from uh, a primary sleep abnormality or whether it's a feature of an underlying behavioral problem that you see in, uh, in someone with PWS. Uh, and we'll talk briefly about the role of sleep hygiene, good sleep hygiene, and uh, we'll touch upon medications and, and their use. Um, and then hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A. So, um, you know, based on today's presentation, you know that sleep disorders are ubiquitous, you know? So pretty much everyone with prior release syndrome uh, has um, a sleep abnormality. The most common uh, thing would be excessive daytime sleepiness due to many different causes. It could be uh, central sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, or prader syndrome by itself causing excessive daytime sleepiness. And I'm sure the remaining presentations throughout the day will talk more about that. Uh, same thing with the genetics and the underlying physiological, physical, brain-related, biological causes of these sleep disturbances, which again, I think um, Dr. Biatch and uh, others will be talking about uh, the genetics uh, of it as well. So uh, I won't uh, go into some of those aspects because those would be repetitive, but um, it is important for people to realize that the, the core team, you know, it really does take a village to take care of a person with Prader-Willi syndrome. Uh, you need a lot of help from friends, family, and different types of clinicians. So in addition to the geneticist and then the endocrinologist, the primary care physician, uh, you really should be thinking about a behaviorist, a psychiatrist, but also a pulmonologist, sleep specialist, who will be helping your child through the different challenges that present over the years, uh, over the life cycle of someone with uh, prior release syndrome. It is also important to differentiate the chronic sleep abnormalities from acute changes. Uh, we're going to touch upon that more, but the, the bottom line is that, uh, you know, if your child has excessive daytime sleepiness uh, or your child needs 12 hours of sleep every night, which is more than what would be normal for someone who is, uh, say, older than eight years old. Um, but there's a sudden change in that sleep where there's a sudden reduced need for sleep, right? Uh, then that should be concerning, right? So we need to know what their baseline is and a change from that baseline without any intervention. So it's not like you started them on modafinil or uh, you know, uh, or bright light therapy or any treatment for the sleepiness, yet there's a sudden change in their need for sleep. They're, they're staying up all night or they're pacing or uh, they're overactive. There are other symptoms to look out for that might suggest that this is, you know, this is something that we need to pay attention to. So uh, at, we need to know uh, our loved one's normal sleep schedule, usual sleep schedule, and look out for sudden changes because that might be a sign of an underlying mental health issue. So to begin with, let's talk about some issues that uh, patients and their families describe with problems with sleep initiation, right? Difficulty falling asleep, basically, right? 
Um, again, we need to think about, is it a new problem or has it been a chronic issue, right? Is it also, and also many people have like, uh, they, they nap during the day. So it's, it's a good habit, although a tough one. I mean, I suggest this to uh, all the parents, right? When they say, bring up a sleep issue, I ask them to keep a simple sleep diary. What time did they go to bed? What time did they wake up? And it's way, but you know, over time, it's hard to do that. I understand that. But making it a habit to do that for a few weeks in a row might help you realize that, you know what? They might be sleeping only six hours at night, but your loved one is sleeping three hours in the day. So overall, they're getting nine hours of sleep, right? So no wonder they're having trouble falling asleep at night that because they're, you know, napping for four hours during the daytime, right? So that's something to keep in mind. The uh, other thing is, uh, you know, there was a lot of change. There were a lot of changes in daytime physical activity during COVID-19. So I did see a lot of my patients having more sleep uh, disturbance because they, A, they had a lot more exposure uh, due to no fault of their own to electronics, which was keeping them up at night, uh, and also reduced physical activity. So if you're not active during the daytime, you're not tired enough to fall asleep, you will have problems with sleep initiation. And that's true for persons with PWS as well. Now, if there is a sudden change uh, or if there, is, if there are problems with sleep initiation, um, which, you know, think about what other things are happening around the same time, right? So is it that the child or the person with PWS has excessive worrying, they're very anxious, right? They're, they're nervous uh, that something bad might happen to their family. Uh, I can't sleep by myself. I have to sleep with mom or dad. I have to uh, sort of constantly keep checking in on them. Uh, and, and you might, if that happens around a transition in the family, so I'll give you an example, which will kind of help you remember this and might or may not apply to you, but if there's a sudden loss in the family, for example, uh, the death of a grandparent, for example, uh, that might make the child very aware of the, the fact that, you know, someone that they're attached to might not exist the next day. And even if they're not verbal about it, even if they don't recognize that they're missing uh, their grandparent or they're afraid that something bad might happen to their parents, they might have difficulty falling asleep because they're having nightmares or they're feeling worried and want that closeness with their parent. There's a phenomenon called regression when they start behaving like a younger person than their age. So to bring it home, so you suppose you have a 12, 13 year old who was absolutely fine sleeping by them by themselves, you know, falling asleep at the right time, didn't need a lot of reminders, had a routine set, and then there's a sudden loss or change of family, even moving cities or moving towns, moving homes, that can cause it as well, uh, cause it as well, where there's a regression, where there's this need for reassurance from an attachment figure because they feel insecure uh, when they separate. So uh, think about changes at home that might be leading to this. Um, and, and again, the other thing that uh, you want to sort of like uh, watch out for is that uh, our, our loved ones with PWS are creatures of habit. So are, so are all of us, right? We, we are all creatures of habit, but persons with PWS uh, are more so, right? Because they don't, always have, you know, ha they, they aren't always able to utilize other ways to self-soothe, right? So we might have, uh, you, you or I might have other ways, like we might meditate, we might have friends or loved ones that, they can, that we can have a conversation with, we might have a hobby, right? Persons with PWS will always uh, preferably go towards a habit that they're used to and want to do it over and over and over again, right? Follow the same routine over and over again. So sometimes it can be helpful to have a sleep sort of uh, a sleep behavior, sleep associated 
sort of uh, you know a plan that okay we we'll brush our change our clothes brush our teeth read a, a, a you know uh, a few pages from a book and then or, or you know the parent will read it to the child and then that becomes the sleep routine but sometimes it can become compulsive they want it done exactly at the same time exactly in the same way by exactly the same uh, you know parent or loved one and then that can become disruptive so try to differentiate between uh, a sleep routine which is healthy with compulsive behavior because our loved ones can very easily fall into that trap so look out for the, uh, those associated behaviors now moving on to excessive daytime sleepiness probably the most common uh, you know way a sleep uh, issue presents itself in patient credibility syndrome um, you have to sort of differentiate that from sleep phase disturbances which are common uh, especially amongst adolescents right so what are sleep phase disturbances it's almost as if the sleep cycle moves right it either becomes advanced which means people are falling asleep early and waking up really really early or it's delayed where they're falling asleep really really late and waking up really really late so both things are true in patients with uh, with pws in my experience so i i see uh, a lot of parents who are kind of used to their loved ones falling asleep really really early and then they assume that it's going to be that way for the rest of their lives so you know if uh, your child or loved one with pws is developing well and their sleep cycle is sort of adjusting to uh, as they age they should not need more than nine hours of sleep right so if they're falling asleep at say you know uh 10 o'clock uh you know or, or nine o'clock they're gonna wake up in eight to nine hours right so if if uh, i have parents who complain to me that hey my uh my child is up like at 4 a.m right but they're also falling asleep at 6 p.m right? So that's an advanced sleep phase difficulty, right? They're just falling asleep so early. That's why they are finding themselves awake that early. Similarly, for children um, who don't have regulated uh, screen time, right? So they, they're watching uh, a screen until very late in the night, which prevents natural melatonin to be relieved uh, from being released. And that can delay sleep onset and thus they're staying asleep for much longer, right? That's a delayed, delayed sleep phase disturbance. So um, now, of course, you're gonna have a separate talk on other sleep disorders. I won't go so much into narcolepsy per se, uh, but uh, you know, the, it's important to think about some symptoms or features of narcolepsy uh, that can look like it's a psychiatric issue, right? Um, and we'll talk more, a little bit more about that in just a, just a few minutes. Um, now, sleep apnea, which is, you know, reduced, um, you know, breathing, you know, for uh, in, in, in late terms. Um, and that could be central because of the way the neurobiology is in persons with PWS or obstructive due to low muscle tone combined with increased weight uh, in the, uh, you know, which sort of obstructs the the flow of air during the nighttime both both of these um you know narcolepsy and sleep apnea due to any cause they lead to excessive daytime sleepiness and excessive daytime sleepiness can look like depression because they can appear immotivated energetic like they don't have enough energy to do things uh, they might feel uh, they might appear disinterested um, and they might even appear irritable, right? Because they're trying to fight sleep. Um, and, uh, you know, it can even sort of, uh, and it can obviously cause poor attention, uh, even appear like psychosis because they appear disorganized as if they don't, you know, they're, uh, they're not making sense or appear confused, right? So um, now the, the common features, and this is the way I'm, I'm using what the most commonly used scale for the determination of excessive daytime sleepiness, uh, which is the Epworth sleepiness scale. 
And these are, this is one way for you to see if your child or loved one with PWS has excessive daytime sleepiness. If you find them nodding off easily while they're just they're sitting and reading and they're nodding off, right? Uh, not laying down, right? Um, falling asleep uh, while watching TV, right? Uh, sitting inactive in a public place. So like they're in a theater or a meeting, no one's talking to them directly. So they're, even though they're in a public space, because they're not being conversed with directly, they're nodding off. Or uh, as a passenger in the car, now this is very common uh, in persons with PWS, um, especially if it's a long drive. But sometimes, um, you know, even if uh, they're just lying down to rest, they might nod off or, uh, you know, a sign of increased uh, severity of sleepiness would be if they're sitting, you're talking to them directly and they're still nodding off. Um, or they're sitting quietly after a meal, right? And they're nodding off. Uh, and then this is another one. Even for a few minutes in traffic, you stop at a traffic light and you turn around and you see that your loved one has nodded off. So it's not just one of these, but several of these together. If they're occurring in your child or loved one, you should um, be thinking about excessive daytime sleepiness. We spoke about how inattention can show up in persons with have, uh, who have excessive daytime sleepiness. Um, you know, like you're in a sleep seminar on a Zoom screen. So let's just take a second to see if you're all awake, right? Because like it's hard to pay attention as is. Just thinking about sleep make, make us sleepy, right? Talking about sleep for a full day, you know, many of you would be nodding off for a second. Uh, and if you're not nodding off, you will lose attention at times, right? So if you're sleepy, you lose attention. So as simple as that. Now you combine that with the fact that persons with Prader-Willi syndrome, because of the way their brain functions and because the front part of the brain and parts of the brain which are uh, responsible for wakefulness, right? The reticular activating system, they're not really being regulated well enough uh, inattention by itself, even without the sleep problems, is very common in PWS. Um, we spoke about the reticular, reticular activating system, which is like, so when uh, when boxers do a knockout where people kind of like uh, are knocked out with one punch, that's because that punch causes the reticular activating system to, uh, you know, to get knocked out for a few seconds, and that leads to uh, to falling asleep. So the hypothalamus has some connectivity to the reticular activating system. And that's probably why uh, some of these sleep problems and the inattention, which is related, are coming up in patients with PWS. Um, hyperactivity is less common, by the way, in PWS, inattention being a lot more common. So ADHD very often is undiagnosed and untreated in PWS because you know, they're like, you know, they're not hyperactive. They're not like jumping all over the place or bouncing off the walls. Because, but there, there might be other reasons for it because they have this uh, low muscle tone. They have reduced uh, ability to sort of uh, be hyperactive physiologically. So the inattention becomes the predominant feature. Uh, as we mentioned, untreated sleep apnea can cause it, excessive daytime sleepiness. And then aggression. Now you take someone who is impulsive because they have ADHD, and you and on top of that, they're they have excessive daytime sleepiness. And very often they would they might get aggressive because they're trying to fight the sleepiness, which is one of the reasons that many of the doctors um, who treat persons with PWS. They know that using stimulants or non-stimulants such as modafinil, armodafinil, stimulants would be medicines uh, like methylphenidate and amphetamines. So some of the brand names that you'd be familiar with are things like Concerta, Vyvanse. Uh, the non-stimulants are uh, the modafinil, armodafinil, and there are some other options as well. The pitolescent, which is, uh, which is being studied right now in PWS, but is well known to address uh, sleepiness coming due to narcolepsy is another one that uh, um, is, uh, is worth paying attention to. And then there are uh, obviously, um, you know, 
um, things which are a little less common. We'll talk about more about things like say bupropion, and we'll talk about that later on. But uh, physicians uh, and uh, medical providers taking care of persons with PWS recognize the therapeutic role of daytime naps, right? So very often a five, what's called a 504 plan, uh, basically a letter, uh, you know, sort of recognizing the fact that this person would need more, need naps. Um, and, uh, you know, 20 minutes a day sometimes is enough to kind of just uh, reinvigorate them and help them re-engage uh, with the classroom. So um, sleep disturbance as a sign of psychiatric illness uh, is, now I'm gonna sort of go a bit more into my specialty, which is behavioral health. Um, so just to go over some of the, the common, you know, um, behavioral issues in Paravilli syndrome, uh, many persons with PWS, we spoke about ADHD already, but other than that, they may have episodic mood disturbance, right? So for example, if your loved one has depression, depression itself might cause problems with sleep, which is why I keep going back to the fact that think about what is usual for your loved one with PWS and what is an acute change in that presentation, right? So if they were if they were not having any problems with falling asleep and all of a sudden, uh, you know, they are having an increased sleep latency means uh, there's a lot of time between uh, them hitting uh, the bed and actually falling asleep. So they're pacing at night, they're not being able to fall asleep at night. That could be a sign of depression. Early morning awakening, so without an alarm, without you having to wake them up, uh, they're up by themselves along with other features of depression, right? Like low energy, feelings of guilt, poor concentration, low appetite, right? Um, and just appearing down and depressed, right? And rarely even expressing that they don't want to live, they don't want to live anymore, right? Uh, you know, uh, having thoughts about suicide. These could all be signs of depression. So um, similarly, the opposite, on the opposite end of the spectrum and something that I see more commonly in Prader-Willi syndrome is a reduced need for sleep with a sudden resolution for hy of hyperphagia. All of a sudden they stop needing uh, or talking about food as, mu as much. And sometimes other features of PWS such as like skin picking also tends to go away all of a sudden. Um, that could be a sign of mania or cycloid psychosis. Now, this is a, it's an alarming condition. It's very kind of in your face, it'll be very obvious. You know, a lot of you who have experienced their child having this, you know, they, you know that they, it needs immediate psychiatric, admi uh, you know, attention, sometimes a psychiatric admission. And, uh, you know, it, uh, it does resolve quite quickly with, uh, with uh, medications. So, um, so reduced need for sleep, as you're hopefully seeing from, uh, from our presentation so far, uh, reduced need for sleep is often a sign or could be a harbinger of something more serious. So you have to think about what else is happening along with this change in need for sleep. Now, I'll just spend a second talking about cataplexy versus catalepsy, and it's, uh, it's a pain to remember that uh, you know, to to kind of notice the difference, but narcolepsy causes cataplexy, and many of you are familiar with it, and you'll get more familiar through the rest of the day because narcolepsy will be brought up again. But cataplexy is when you lose muscle tone due to uh, or during times of emotional excitement, right? Uh, and uh, cataplexy, which is uh, associated with narcolepsy also might cause some hallucinations, but there are different types of hallucinations. These hallucinations only show up when the person is about to fall asleep or about to wake up. So that's cataplexy. Catalepsy, on the other hand, is a sign of psychosis, right? It's a psychiatric you know, condition uh, in which the, there is, you know, it's almost like a, 
um, the, the the person might even stop moving or they it, it is called waxy flexibility. So I've had uh, people who, you know, are not eating as much and you have to feed them because if you give them like a cup of, you know, a, a drink, you know, they're going to be super slow with bringing it to their lips or or they may not, they might be stuck in, in mid air, you know. So um, that is catalepsy, which is a sign of which is associated with cycloid psychosis. So uh, noticing those differences, cataplexy, along with excessive daytime. So if, they're, if the person is more sleepy and they're kind of losing physical control uh, during times of emotional excitement while they're crying or laughing, that is unlikely to be due to a, a psychiatric condition. On the other hand, if they're not sleeping, they, they have uh, you know, they have some beliefs that are not based in reality. They're overly suspicious, might be even getting aggressive. And they have these weird movements where they get stuck in positions or they're extremely slow in their movements, but not really falling asleep. That would be catalepsy and that would be a psychiatric condition. Um, so again, decreased need for sleep in Prader-Willi syndrome especially when it occurs suddenly, right, is unusual and should be taken seriously. So uh, let's talk about medicines for a second here, right? We have, um, you know, we have to think about the, uh, the many of the medicines that are used in Prader-Willi syndrome, um, especially medicines that are used to help with behavior might themselves cause sleep problems, right? So let's go over some uh, aspects to keep in mind. So uh, timing of the dosage. So if you, if you find that you start a new medicine for uh, your loved one with PWS and they, they experience a change in their sleep, you should discuss with your doctor uh, whether or not that medicine could be associated with that sleep problem. And sometimes the doctors forget to talk about or may not remind you of when to take those medicines uh, and how it can lead to either sleepiness or, or difficulty falling asleep, depending on the time uh, of day. So the medicines that are commonly prescribed in PWS and can cause sleepiness, right, and sometimes are used to help with insomnia, difficulty falling asleep, are medicines like benzodiazepines, right, so just to clarify, benzodiazepines would be things like, um, say, Xanax or Ativan or Clonopin. I'm using brand names only because that would be more familiar, um, and I'm sort of not endorsing any one of those medicines, but these are uh, commonly used medicines. And you're probably familiar with things like Benadryl, which is an anticholinergic, right? So if you give, if suppose uh, your child has, you know, some doctors, although it's not the best choice for it, some doctors tend to give Benadryl for skin picking and, uh, and that can cause a lot of sleepiness. So if you're giving Benadryl during, during the daytime, uh, if your child is falling asleep in school or has a lot of sleepiness, that's the explanation for it. And it should be given at nighttime. There are some antidepressant type medicines such as uh, Paxil, right? And some of the older antidepressants, right, like amitriptyline, uh, nortriptyline, these are older medicines, but uh, that should be taken, also those, you know, medicines should be taken at bedtime because they cause sleepiness. There are some antipsychotics, um, mo in fact, most antipsychotics uh, tend to cause people to feel sleepy and should be taken at night. Now, for you to, just to give you a sense, uh, not all antipsychotics are prescribed for psychosis. So your child, your loved one might be on, say, something like risperidone, also called risperidol, or uh, Abilify, aripiprazole. These medicines may be prescribed for mood problems, or for aggression, or for irritability, or for skin picking even. But they're called antipsychotics, right? So as a class, most of these antipsychotics actually make you feel very sleepy and should be taken uh, at bedtime. There are some exceptions. 
Uh, and there are some medicines such as uh, aripiprazole or Bilify, which can actually be activating, but we still usually give it at bedtime because, uh, you know, there's a side effect called akathisia, which is a lot of restlessness, inability, like feeling an inner sense of restlessness that gets better, that, you know, that you can kind of sleep, get over it by sleeping through that side effect. And uh, sometimes we tend to give that at night as well. Uh, I know there's a, a lot of uh, technical nuance here and, you know, uh, given our time together, I may not be able going into a lot of depth, but feel free to put in your Q, Q, uh, questions and Q&A, and I'll be happy to help as much as possible. Um, another class of medicines, which I use very frequently, um, almost all of my patients prior to syndrome are on alpha-2 agonists, you know, medicines like guanfacine, which I'm doing clinical trial on as well, uh, or clonidine. These two uh, medicines also tend to make people sleepy and should be taken in the evenings. Now, there are medicines that um, help with uh, you know, that, that might actually cause insomnia. And some of them I've put in green because they actually may be used as treatment of excessive daytime sleepiness, right? But uh, stimulants, right, uh, like we discussed before, uh, Adderall, Vyvanse, Concerta, Ritalin, these are all stimulants. They help with ADHD, but they also, uh, you know, cause wakefulness. So you don't want to give them in in the nighttime because uh, or too late into the day in fact i usually tell parents not to give it after uh, in the afternoon at all like uh, after 12 o'clock um, unless they're taking only the short acting medicines stimulants can be long acting or short acting the long acting medicines must be taken during the morning the short acting medicines sometimes uh, are okay to use in the afternoons as well but not too late because even the shortest acting one might continue working for up to six hours, right? So just keep that in mind. Modafinil or modafinil, again, they're wakefulness inducing medicines, so you don't want to take them in the afternoons because they'll interfere with sleep. Theophylline is another one. It al almost works like caffeine, for example. That's a medicine used for asthma or for COPD. Uh, so and that I put it in there just as an example of how medicines that you, you may not think is affecting your loved one's sleep might actually be causing it. So when if you start any new medicine and you notice a change in sleep, look at the list of side effects. Um, you know, you can go on a, a, on a reliable source uh, online uh, to see if, uh, if that medicine could be causing uh, sleepiness or uh, insomnia. Bupropion is another one. Uh, it's it's um, the brand name is Wellbutrin. It comes in many different uh, forms, and uh, you know long and short acting forms. Uh, but bupropion, I, I use it uh, in uh, some patients with prior release syndrome if they have depression uh, and uh, they have problems with excessive daytime sleepiness. Again, should be taken in the mornings only. Otherwise, it interferes with sleep at night. Um, and most, uh, so, so like I said, some antidepressants like Paxil make people sleepy. On the other hand, most antidepressants have an upper type effect on the body, right? So medicines like Lexapro, Selexa. Now, this, this is what's probably going to come as a surprise to many people on the call, because just because they're antidepressants, people just tend to give it at nighttime and, uh, you know, the doctors, if the doctor doesn't tell you separately, you may not like remember to give those medicines during the daytime. But most antidepressants like Lexapro, Selexa, Prozac, Zoloft, all of these medicines are actually given in the, uh, should be taken in the morning because it interfere, they interfere with sleep. All right. Um, now, moving to sleep hygiene, I want to start first with uh, the fact that, you know, you need to practice what uh, what is good for your child as well, right? And your sleep is extremely important. The care, you know, caregiver fatigue, uh, what, you know, or caregiver burden um, is, is not only real, it's dangerous, right? Uh, you know, it's, it's common for caregivers 
of uh, individuals with chronic illnesses in general to have mental health issues themselves. And a big part of it is not getting enough rest, right? So it's a, it's a basic human need to rest and sleep is restorative. You know, it's very important to sleep well. And chronic sleep deprivation can of course affect your physical and mental health, just like it affects your child's physical and mental health. So whatever I see next applies not just to your loved ones, but also to yourself, right? To have a specific bedtime and, and a wake up time that does not vary much. And the fact is that the wake up time is actually even more important than the specific bedtime. So it turns out that our sleep, our sleep cycle uh, is often, uh, you know, reset uh, or is determined by the time that we wake up in the morning, right? So, uh, you know, it is important to try and wake up at the same time every day uh, in order to not mess with your sleep cycle. Um, have a bedtime ritual or a bedtime routine that signals to the body that it's time to sleep. That's going back to an earlier slide where, where we said that in a person with PWS, it's good to have those bedtime routines, but you don't want it to become compulsive. So there needs to be some room for flexibility in the sense that if mom is not, uh, you know, reading them a bedtime story, it's okay if dad is, right? Or if on one day, uh, you know, the uh, they, they don't have their specific sheet uh, to, uh, to take cover in, uh, it's okay to use another sheet. So have some flexibility, but having a routine and sticking to it as much as possible um, you know, so that it reminds the person that it's time to go to go to sleep. Uh, of course, caffeinated beverages. Now, I have seen that a lot more parents are actually giving caffeine or coffee to their loved ones with PWS. Um, and uh, again, it's your personal preference. You have to think about the repercussions. I mean, hey, I like coffee too, but... Uh, you know, you have to think about the fact that no two cups of coffee will be the same, right? And uh, some people are, lot, are a lot more sensitive to caffeine than others are. Um, and as a general rule, you don't want to give coffee to, uh, you know, uh, too late in the day, um, you know, in the afternoons, because it will come in the way of them falling asleep. Um, and also exercising, which is great. Exercising during the day or having 30 minutes of a, a brisk workout that causes some elevation in the heart rate, some sustained elevation in the heart rate is uh, excellent for the body and for the mind and for sleep. However, it has been shown that if you exercise and immediately try to fall uh, asleep, right, within a couple of hours, your body won't let you because it's too excited, right? You really revved it up and you need to give it some time to calm down and go into sleep mode. Um, and then uh, similarly, it's hard to fall asleep when you're staring at the sun, right? You don't want, you know, you don't want a bright screen in front of you because that gives your brain very clear signals. It prevents the release of melatonin, which is the hormone that regulates our circadian or sleep cycle. Uh, so you need to turn off electronics. Now, this slide, in this slide, I said 30 minutes just to be generous, but really, ideally, uh, you know, electronics should be off, uh, you know, over an hour before bedtime. Now, before I move on, the other thing is that you need to have, make sure that uh, your loved one or yourself, another part of sleep hygiene is to associate the bed with sleep, right? Your room, your bedroom should be associated with sleep. So try to take other activities out of the bedroom, right? So if you're if you uh, want to play board games, or if you want to watch TV, if you want to sort of like um, have uh, a, you know a meal, try to keep it outside of the bedroom. Your bedroom should be your space to rest and sleep, um, and it's your you. It should be almost like a, think of it as you know right from back in the caveman times. You know, we would go into a dark, quiet, uh, sort of cool space, which is comfortable, and people go there to sleep. 
And that's how you should look, you should think about your bedroom. Um, now, uh, you know, so now that you know about sleep hygiene, uh, you know a bit about our circadian rhythm, how it is set by what time we wake up, how uh, exposure to sun, by the way. So like if you, you want your child to be up during the day, you want to expose them to, to sunlight. So that brings me to the use of bright light therapy, right? So um, as I was, uh, you know, in my work with Bradley syndrome, I realized that we don't have a lot of effective tools without using medication and medications have side effects, right? Not medications are not for everyone. So it's like, what could be used, especially, you know, in North America, uh, we, you know, once the winter sets in, there's not much sun exposure, right? And, uh, and that might have uh, some negative effects on excessive daytime sleepiness. So I, I looked up uh, non-medication options and, uh, you know, I was, as a psychiatrist, I'm familiar with the use of bright light therapy uh, for the treatment of what's called seasonal affective disorder, something which is very common in Canada, for example. And people have these bright lamps at home in order to kind of like simulate the effects of the sun and brighten their mood, right? So I was like, okay, has that been studied in Prader-Willi syndrome? And it hasn't. Uh, what else has it been studied? And it's been studied in not just in folks with seasonal affective disorder, it's been studied in patients with depression in general, with bipolar disorder, patients with traumatic brain injuries, patients with Parkinson's disease. And in all of them, it has been shown to not just improve mood, it's been shown to increase wakefulness. So it was obviously, you know, a no brainer sort of uh, to, to sort of test this out. And I'm, uh, you know, uh, grateful uh, to have, um, uh, you know, obtained some fen funding to test its effect. So, um, and some studies show that in, in kids with obesity, it's helped with uh, weight and cognition as well. So we have designed a study to look at bright light therapy and uh, how exposure to bright light therapy um, twice a day, uh, just for 30 minutes will help. Now, this is a study that we're doing, at least for now, only in children, pe uh, people uh, younger than 18. Uh, it's home-based, um, uh, you know, uh, within natural settings. So you don't have to travel anywhere to New York to see me. It's completely remote. And we are enrolling for this, uh, we're starting to enroll um, uh, in October for this uh, study. So uh, that's, I think, you know, it's 317, we'll have about 10 or so minutes. Um, I wanna thank you again for having me join uh, you all uh, for this presentation. I'm uh, looking forward to the Q&A. Um, this is uh, my, our phone number for uh, all the studies that we're conducting. I didn't go into all of them, but I think the one that is relevant to our talk today is bright light therapy. I also wanna give a shout out to uh, Dr. Cataletto and other sleep disorder specialists uh, who helped me write a chapter on sleep disorders and Prader-Willi syndrome uh, in this book. Um, I want to give a special shout out to uh, to Mr. Ward and PWSA and uh, for Mr. Ward uh, very uh, kindly, uh, you know, said uh, very good things about my book and she's uh, her words are actually printed in the back of the book. So, <laughs> you know, I'm grateful for her, for her support. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Um, great presentation, lots of information. Um, we, do, we do have some questions, so we'll just jump right in and um, see how many we can get through before we have to end. But uh, first question is, um, it says, my son has been diagnosed with narcolepsy, but not sleep apnea and bipolar. Um, he's been sleeping a lot, and I was thinking it might be depression. He recently had a psychotic episode as well. Is this all tied together? In one sense, it is, because all of these things are related to the vulnerability of the brains of a person with prader willi syndrome. But I don't want everybody who's listening to just, like, 
think of this as alarmist, right? I mean, there's treatment for all of these. So unfortunately, uh, because of the way the brain is structured in PWS and also at the receptor level, right? Now this is, uh, you know, a bit too technical, but then there are, there are certain receptors uh, receptors in the brain uh, which are responsible for either activating the brain or calming it down. And the ratio of those receptors makes a lot of difference in whether or not someone gets psychotic or depressed. And unfortunately, in parabolic syndrome, then there seems to be a problem with that ratio, right? The, the, calm, the calming type of receptors seem to be lesser as compared to the activating type of, uh, of uh, you know, receptors, which is not a problem for most of your life. But during adolescence, my guess would be that this person that you're talking with, your, your loved one with PWS, probably had their psychotic symptom come up during adolescence or young adulthood. And that's when that ratio is, is sort of like, uh, is uh, reaches sort of a tipping point and you it can be thrown into uh, um, into that. Now narcolepsy I think is unrelated. So they might have this so again, the chronic issue is narcolepsy. The psychotic episode is an acute change. So both of them are uh, are common unfortunately in PWS, but not everyone who has narcolepsy will get a psychotic, uh, episode and vice versa. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, the next question here is, do you have or know of anyone who has experience or has written papers on the new use of new sleep agents such as a Rexin antagonist or Su Suvorexant? I'm so sorry. I'm not sure how to say it. Suvorexant. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That's interesting. I personally have not prescribed it. Um, it's a good point. That's something that uh, we might, I might have to read more about and research more about. To my knowledge, I, I think I would have heard if it was being pursued. Um, and uh, I don't think it is being pursued currently. Uh, but uh, it is, you know, the orexin um, receptor system is a target for uh, modafinil and, and uh, armodafinil already. I mean, that's the hypothesis. That's how it is. they are supposed to be working. Um, so if we have more um, sort of agents, it's good, but uh, I'm not very familiar with uh, that particular agent being used in PWS. Thank you. So there's a, a couple of questions or of interest on the bright light therapy study. Um, number one, can we still enroll in that study? And if so, how do we do that? Um, yes, yeah, so the number. Your, oh, go, yeah. ahead. go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was just in the second part of that. Is there an effect that you will see if it's done three to four times a week? Okay, so uh, all right. So the first question, the answer to the first question is that we we just opened up the study. You know, so you can uh, now is a good time to call and uh, express interest about the study. Uh, we just start. I mean, we haven't even shipped out the devices yet. So I mean, it's gonna. I think if you call now, uh, you might get enrolled in the study in late October. Right, that would be the type of uh, timeline. But it's kind of fresh out the press, and uh, um, you know uh, the the second part of the question is that's an interesting point. We are not going to be testing that in this particular study. In this particular study, we want everybody, all the participants, to get exposed to bright light for thirty minutes twice a day, right? Uh, because our hypothesis would be that that would be the because remember when I say bright light it's very it's it's really bright right it's like an, it's like staring it's like you know having sunlight like you can see on my hands right now so uh, so that is uh, um, you know and you're not staring at it you're in gaze direction so you're the child or the person with PWS will be sort of they will be sort of writing or drawing we provide some activities for them to do while the light is in their gaze direction. So I, I don't think it's been tested as to what happens if you'd give it alternatively or only four, three, four times a week. Uh, we do know that you, you don't wanna give it too late in the day because obviously it will keep you from falling asleep. 
And we've based this study off of studies that have been done in, say, Parkinson's disease and TBI, in which they found that twice a day dosing seems to be the most effective for excessive daytime sleepiness. So, but good questions. Thank you. But the number said, can I, is right can I ask a follow-up question to that? So <laughs> you mentioned twice a day, but not wanting to give it too far into the day. When is that second timing occurring? So around 2 p.m. is what we are seeing. So so we are uh, we are assuming that maybe because they're all children, most of them will be in school. So it'll mm -hmm. be before and after school. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, we have a question here that says, my daughter wakes up to check what time it is frequently throughout the night. Would this fall under the obsessive behavior that affects sleep? Yeah, and you know, a lot of a lot of folks without PWS do that too. And clock watching, reading the clock, especially if you're reading like an analog clock, requires a lot of brain power, right? So you can't you cannot be asleep or you cannot like you have to wake yourself completely wake yourself up completely, read the, the watch, and then fall back asleep. So as you can imagine, it's very disruptive to the sleep cycle. So if your loved one is listening to me, or you can maybe show them this recording later on, just this clip and say, hey, listen, it's a well-known problem that some people, due to anxiety and could be a compulsive behavior, would watch, you know, uh, would look at clocks repeatedly, and that's very disruptive to sleep cycle. I would, in, in that person's case, I might actually suggest moving the clock out of the room. You know, I know there might be some negotiating back and forth to, to be able to do that, but it may not be worth it to have uh, a time instrument in the room for someone who is watching uh, the clock obsessively because it will disrupt their sleep. Thank you. Yes. Good luck negotiating moving that clock out of the room, right? <laughs> uh, um, another question we have is, should we be concerned about possible sedating effects of some of the drugs mentioned when we are speaking of people with central obstructive apnea and also the risk of weight gain with some of the antipsychotics for the same reason? Okay, so yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. So that's why I gave a list of some of the medicines which are commonly prescribed and you should sort of like look out for sleepiness. I want you to know that most people, if they take the medicine for long enough, the sleepiness tends to go away, right? Uh, you, I also want you to know uh, that it's, it's probably not a good idea to stop the medicine suddenly because if you stop the medicine suddenly, some medicines, like for example, the benzodiazepine, so if your child is on Xanax or Clonopin or Ativan, you stop it suddenly, not only will they have a lot of insomnia, they might actually, you know, if they're on high dosages, it might cause seizures. So you gotta take this, uh, you know, uh, discuss it with your doctors before you make any changes. With medicines such as guanfacine, which I prescribe all the time, many of you might have, uh, you know, experienced taking guanfacine or your child. It takes about a week for the sleepiness to go away. When I say go away, it goes back to baseline. Like in the sense, if your child was sleepy to begin with, the guanfacine uh, might make them sleepier for a few days, and then it tends that sleepiness tends to go away because it takes about five half lives, which is about four doses, four to five days for them to get used to the medicine. Some medicines like antipsychotics, they, they, even if they don't cause sleepiness, they can still cause weight gain. So for with antipsychotics, the cause of the weight gain is not just the, the sleepiness, they directly affect the metabolism, the rate of metabolism of the body and there are other, way, other ways it works too. So there are other reasons. Thank you. I have one question I'd like to ask, if that's okay. Um, you mentioned the 504 plan and putting in an accommodation like a nap in the school system. One of the things that we hear from parents a lot is that the school is observing what they would consider maladaptive or challenging behaviors. When this is something that maybe is more related to a sleep issue, Besides the NAPs, do you have other recommendations that we should be encouraging parents to add as accommodations? So first of all, they shouldn't be saying no, right? I mean, there are lots of like, resources, uh, you know, uh, like uh, you can 
show them a chapter, that chapter from my book in which uh, NAP is recommended. You can go to, you know, the websites for PWSA. I'm sure you, you'll have, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a NAP recommendation in there. And that that can be accompanied with your request for the 504 uh, plan. Um, and then the second part of the question, Stacey, was? Um, any other accommodations that you would recommend besides just an app? For sleepiness, unfortunately, it's uh, it's hard, right, uh, for them to, you know, or sometimes, you know, just keep putting your head down on the desk. That could be something. Uh, I do sometimes recommend preferential seating, which is like mm -hmm. in front of the class, or increased test taking time, because that inattention that comes from the sleepiness, even if they don't have ADHD, they mm -hmm. might need more test taking time. So those might be the other 504 type of sort of accommodations that schools will be willing to provide. Thank you. Great. Um, I'm not seeing, does anybody else have a question? Um, not seeing any other questions right now. And I actually, we're at time. Oh, here's one, one last question. Oh, thanks for the reply. My question was intended to ask about the dangers of incidents worsening with the sedating effects not about them causing daytime sleepiness. So maybe if you could address that then. So Paige, what, what would be the... So uh, basically asking um, about the dangers of incidents worsening with the sedating effects of the medication, not necessarily the daytime sleepiness. So is it related to a previous question that was asked? Um, yes, there was a previous question. Um, if I can find it here, <laughs> I can read you. I can read you her previous question. Do we not have to be concerned about possible sedating effects of some of the drugs mentioned when we are speaking of people with central obstructive apnea and also the risk of weight gain with some of the antipsychotics for the same reason? That was the original. Okay, question. okay. So I guess you know uh, if I understand correctly. Uh, is the sleep apnea itself going to get worse, right? Uh, you know, so most of those medicines that other than, so the only medicine which can actually depress respiration and cause more problems with breathing out of those list of medicines that I mentioned as the ones that can cause more sleepiness are the, the benzodiazepine type medicines. So if your child has a has really bad uh, sleep apnea, I would not give them, you know, again, discuss it with your doctors because you don't want to stop it suddenly. It's not advisable to give them benzodiazepine, Xanax, Clonopin, Ativan, medicines like that. Um, and as far as the, the metabolic side effects go, you're right. The longer the exposure is to antipsychotics, and the higher the dose, there seems to be more weight gain. But keep in mind that for some reason, we don't know exactly why, a lot of the weight gain tends to occur in the first three months of starting an antipsychotic medicine. So if you can add some behavioral activation, some activities such as exercising and clamp down on uh, their uh, sort of uh, on their, on, and be more uh, aware of food security, during those first three months, you might be able to dodge a lot of weight gain. Thank you. Thanks. And someone commented they got your book several days ago. It's great. So, thank you. Thank you. I thank appreciate you. that very much. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you, Dr. Singh. We appreciate your time um, and we appreciate the presentation. Uh, again, th these will be available. Um, the recordings will be available by Friday of this week, if not before. And um, I hope everybody has a great rest of your day. And we have three or four more sessions to go today. So um, come back at um, three o'clock central, four o'clock Eastern to join us. And thanks again, Dr. Singh. Thank, Thank you. Dr. Singh. Thank, Thank you so much for having me. Take care.